Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Uncorked with Funny Wine Girl. This is Funny Wine Girl, aka Janine Luby, and uh, I am so excited to bring you. Uh, we were we were doing some really kind of like. Well, this is kind of in line with that. We had a uh, mental health uh, month in May. We spoke with Marie from, I say, I keep saying we, as if there's someone like a mouse in my pocket when I do this, but Marie Onakevich from NAMI Northeast Region PA uh, spoke a couple of weeks ago at, all about mental health and the events we had here in Scranton and Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I, I have to say, I should report everything went fantastic. Uh, we had Gab Benesso here from Pittsburgh speaking about her bipolar disorder, how she made uh, manages it, how healing humor is. Uh, she was speaking to the public. She was speaking to clients and staff at the Scranton Counseling Center. And then we had this fundraising comedy event, which everything went fantastic. So check out on my uh, Facebook, all the details on that. It went great. And then we had um, uh, Kristen and Trish talking about somatic embodiment. So very healthy stuff. And I think today, and while I was going to say we're taking a departure, but we're not really, because today's story is going to be about, if you look at it, uh, being your best self and, and betterment and wellness as well. So I always like to say how I know my guests, because I think it is so important that we're open to meeting people, to connecting, because you never know how you can help one another, how you could share each other's gifts and talents. So today's guest actually just met a few weeks ago at an event, my friend Tina Gallagher that you've heard from on this podcast at least twice. She is a romance author. We attended this event in New Jersey. I think it was Columbia, New Jersey at uh, a winery. And uh, it's it's a, an event that's for authors. And of course, people come out, they meet the authors, they buy books, they get the book signed, they drink wine. It's a great little event. And I met today's guest and I liked her story. I honestly, what caught my eye was her, uh, her whole display uh, at her state there, her table was so eye catching. I was like, this is very cool. I have to stop and talk to this person. So I will, without further ado, introduce you to chef and author, Jill Marie Denton. Hello, Jill. Hi, everybody. <laughs> How you here. doing? I'm all right. I can't complain. It's a beautiful day out here. So couldn't ask for much more than this. Well, that's great. And you're, so I, um, this is broadcast, obviously podcast can be heard from anywhere. I'm in Scranton, Northeastern Pennsylvania. You are in, I believe, Delaware. Is that right? Yes, I live in Dover, Delaware. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just before we get into your, you know, your uh, credentials as a chef, your your book that I really want to get into your journey. Um, could you tell us, just tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you're from Delaware, I believe, a little bit about your schooling, a little bit of background for the everyone to hear about. Sure. So I was born and raised here in the first state. Um, and I pretty much knew that I wanted a food-based career my entire life. You know, I wrote my first recipe at eight years old basically just combining all the crap that was in the fridge door, but a recipe is a recipe. So at 17, I graduated from high school and I moved out to Chicago and I went to a Le Cordon Bleu school out there. So I am Le Cordon Bleu accredited and I have their pastry certification as well. So, and I've been in the industry now 21 years, which is crazy to think about because it doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but I've worked all over the place. I've worked at hotels and different restaurants and bars and catering and all sorts of different types of, of avenues until I finally found my place, which is as a personal chef and caterer to folks who have trouble ordering food from just anywhere. I cater to dietary restrictions and allergies quite a bit. And I'm very proud to be Better Business Bureau accredited. I, I'm fully licensed and certified here in the state. So I'm able to suit a demographic that was kind of underserved in this community. So that's how I stay in the food industry now. As far as being an author, I kind of stumbled backwards into that one, but I've always enjoyed a good story. And I started writing years and years ago as a hobby. And I started writing the book that you're talking about um, back in 2020. And this was like 2020, I'll say 2019, 2020, just to kind of capture the health and wellness that you kind of opened with a little bit. So let me, um, before we get into the book, and it's called Clearing the Rail. Uh, yes. That's right. Um, I, I'm just curious if you don't mind me asking. So we're, you know, we're connected now on Facebook and I posted a picture and you said my old stomping grounds. Do you have a connection yeah. with Northeast PA? And I'd love to know what that is. You probably told me and I apologize for forgetting. <laughs> yeah. So back in, let's see, I guess it was 20, it was 2005, 2006. I actually lived in West Pittston, Pennsylvania. Um, so not too far from where you were. 
And I worked at a bunch of different places up there. Actually, when I first moved up there, I was working two full-time jobs. I was working full-time at the Starbucks in Wilkes-Barre, which I assume is still there. Yeah. And I was working nights at Pizza Lovin', which I assume is still there. So I worked there too. And then eventually I transitioned to be full-time for the Wyoming Valley healthcare system. And I was a kitchen manager at the hospital in Wilkes-Barre. So I did some food service work up there and, and I at that time was in a relationship with someone whose family was up there. So that was my reason for being up there. Okay. Yeah. When I was, um, I did a comedy show last week at LB distillery, which is this great little place in a really, they've revitalized along the water there, the river, uh, in Pittston and you wrote my old stopping grounds. And I'm like, okay, I have to ask her about that. Cause I don't know <laughs> if I knew that your connection to Northeastern Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, no, I don't want to get back in 15 years. Like I haven't, oh, wow. I, I would have to, I'm sure I would be able to find my way around again because it kind of comes back to you, but I haven't been up there in a very long time. So it was nice to see some of the views and some of your pictures. Yeah. And I will give them credit. Pittston, they've got beautiful murals on the side of the building. Uh, they're, they're people who are really working well together. Uh, I'd say in the community, uh, the trails that you can walk on a lot of great thriving businesses. So I love to see that. I mean, Scranton, I'm only like 20, 25 minutes away. So it's a close uh, drive. So it was great to, to see what they're doing down there. Um, cool. But I don't want to get off the rail here, so to speak, from what we want to talk about. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, before we get into the book, so you have a business in Delaware. Yes. It's uh, delivery dinners. Is that right? Yes. And so as you mentioned, it's personal. So anyone could, uh, could, uh, could they subscribe, I guess, to like a, it's a certain amount of meals per week or how do you do that? So the best thing is I don't make anybody do that. So I'm here when you need me to be, and I disappear when you don't need me. So I don't, really subscribe to the whole, like you have to buy a certain amount of food at a time, or I need to hear from you every month. I'm really a stopgap for a lot of folks who are trying new diet plans, who maybe newly discovered an allergy and they're not sure what they can eat. Because not only do I provide food service and delivery, as the name would suggest, delivery to home and office and such, but I also provide custom menus to my clients. So if you contact me and you say, I'm really interested in you cooking for me, I will actually interview you and find out what you like, what you don't like, what you absolutely will not eat. Um, I ask questions like, you know, you and I are going out to dinner. Where are we going and what are you ordering? Um, are you are you averse to anything? Can I absolutely not put black pepper or mushrooms on stuff? You just won't eat it. And then that allows me to really dial your menu in. And it allows me to create a menu of items you're excited about, things you actually want to eat. And then you can order from me whenever you choose. I also have a company, a side company called Sweets for All, where I do baking for every dietary restriction and allergy. And I deliver that as well. So I can do people's wedding cakes if they're vegan or gluten-free. I can do, you know, bake sale items and everything in between. So folks in Delaware and you're in, I think you said Dover, is that right? Yes, but I can deliver all pretty much all of Delaware to the Southern parts of Pennsylvania, like the Philadelphia area, as well as down, you know, and over into Maryland towards the Bay. So I cover oh, wonderful. a pretty big footprint. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. That's great. Uh, so let's talk about, and I don't know which way is the best to approach it. So hearing you talk about, I love what you do, like interviewing people. I think that's so smart because like you said, you know, you're going out to dinner, where are we going? And you'll find out what people really like right that way. Um, how should we approach? I'd like to hear your story. Um, I know you talked about uh, a journey where you had uh, major weight loss and I believe you talk about that in the book, but what, you were a chef already, right? So I'd love to hear from you. And I know we talked briefly about this, that it's not an easy life being a chef. Um, talk, if you could share with us a little bit about what that was like and what made you say in your life, okay, I need to make changes and how, what that led to and how everything came about. Sure. So the term clearing the rail, which is the title of the book, didn't come about until a couple of years ago when I was already in the process. So I'll double back to that. The whole thing started, you know, I, I was always a food abuser. I was always somebody who used food for the wrong reasons. And what do I mean by that? I mean that I never enjoyed food for the nutritional aspect of it. There was always some emotional reason for eating. There was always some background reason for eating, even when I was a kid. So, and, and my family does too, you know, you learn from, from your environment in a lot of ways. So I got into food service knowing full well that 99% of my thoughts were about food anyway. So it kind of made sense for me to just continue along that trajectory. And yes, chefs are terrible, terrible examples of a way to live. If you've never known a chef, let me try to encompass what that means. We are impulsive, sporadic, addicted people. We work minute to minute, 
in a very hot, very demanding environment that's completely thankless most of the time because you don't even know we're there. The food comes out of the kitchen, that's all that matters, right? Doesn't really matter who's behind the swinging door. And our entire life is over a hot plate or a fryer uh, being potentially yelled at by a chef that's above your level or by servers who are frustrated. And so you spend your night kind of running circles around yourself, just doing the best you can to get the work done. And of course, the more successful the restaurant is, the more money you make, the busier you are, especially on the weekends and things like that. So you end up putting yourself pretty low on your own priority list. And you end up not really taking your life that seriously because you're just living minute to minute. For the bulk of my 20s, like after I graduated from culinary school, I was convinced I wasn't going to make 40. Like I just lived such an impulsive and crazy lifestyle. I didn't sleep working two jobs, like I mentioned before to you. It's just, it was a mess of just trying to keep bills paid. And that's why a lot of chefs, unfortunately, succumb to addictions of other sorts. Mine was always food and relationship addictions, but some other people fall into drug abuse and alcohol addictions because it's a coping mechanism to the type of lifestyle that we live. So a lot of the times I prioritized my customers way above where I prioritized myself. And it's not an uncommon story for people, no matter what industry they're in, because a lot of folks do that. They care for people all day long, and then they put themselves at the absolute bottom. And I can't tell you how many times I stopped at the late night Chinese place or the late night Taco Bell on my way home, as opposed to preparing myself the quality of food I was making for you. My life would have been very different if I had eaten the way that I feed you. Now, that being said, we feed you a lot of butter and salt and stuff too. So it's not great. But my point is, is it's probably still better than Taco Bell. But again, I prioritize myself way down at the bottom and the way that I live my lifestyle, kind of riding fast and loose, moving around a lot. I really didn't think I would make it to this age. But after years and years of struggling and feeling like the goals that were in front of me, the goals that my physicians wanted for me was completely out of reach. You might as well tell me to walk on the moon for some of the goals that my, my doctors had for me. Like my one doctor told me I needed to weigh 200 pounds. Well, there was no way that was going to happen, right? So you might as well give me some insurmountable goal. I put myself down for a lot of years knowing that I would never be that. And I had myself convinced. And that's part of the problem when you have an addiction is that you just can't see the other side of it. It's too hard. So I finally, years ago, about almost six years ago, I had had enough. I was in pain. I couldn't sleep. I was stressed out all the time. My financial debt was getting out of control because I spent way too much money on being indulgent, not just with food, but with everything. Because again, I just didn't have the, the right mindset of living for a long time. And that was kind of bred into me, unfortunately. So about six years ago, I turned to my then boyfriend, now husband and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm at a breaking point where I can't walk a quarter of a mile without having to sit down. You know, I'm already regretting the idea of going on a honeymoon because I can't do anything fun with you. I'm too big. I'm in too much pain. So that was when I decided I was done with fad dieting. I was done with trying things, knowing or, or feeling like they weren't going to work because I cheated at all those things anyway, to be honest with you. If you put a chef on a really restrictive diet, they're going to find a way to cheat. It just happens. I know what tastes good. It's really hard for me to stick to something that <laughs> it's hard. I'm very spiteful too, which is not a good combination. So <laughs> if you tell me I can't have some, I'm going to eat it anyway. So I just decided I needed a medical approach. I needed a more scientific approach. And that's where Clearing the Rail really came from. At least it started in 2017. So it's been almost six years now. Wow. So what, uh, is it a good time to ask, what does that mean, Clearing the Rail? Sure. So, and again, that, that term didn't really come up until like 2019, 2020, when I was already kind of in it. But in chef terms, clearing the rail is um, clearing all of the tickets that are hanging over your head. So when you come into the, to the restaurant and you sit down and the server takes your order, when they submit it to the kitchen, it's, it creates a ticket or a chit, as we would call it. And then you would take that ticket and hang it on the rail, which is that stainless steel bar that's above your head. And you spend the entire night working the rail meaning you're trying to clear the rail, get rid of all the customers in the dining room, get all the food made so that you can continue on with your night. You can actually leave and go home and enjoy yourself. And I realized at some point along the way that this was sort of a metaphor to my struggles because a lot of the things that were holding me back were in here. I knew what to eat and how much and how to cook and all of those things. So I had an advantage over a lot of people where I had a nutrition background. I just ignored it for a long time. But I also understood that a lot of the stuff that was holding me back, a lot of the tickets on my rail were mental things, were things, negative things that were said to me that I'll never unhear. Pictures of how thin I was as a kid, 
um, the abuse I've put myself through, the not feeling like I'm good enough, you know, having been divorced before and having the, the trauma that goes along with that, all of these mental barriers were on my rail. And slowly, one at a time, I'm having to take them down off the rail, look at them and decide, can I clear this or not? Is this something I can talk to a therapist about and deal with? Is this something I'm strong enough to overcome now? Or does it have to go back up on the rail and deal with it later? But only through the process of undoing how you got somewhere can you really start to acknowledge and move forward from there. So, and we'd love for people to get the book. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> want you to give away what's in the book because that wouldn't be too too smart. But can you give us at least a snapshot of how you managed to get to this place where you're healthy now? Sure. So the first part of the book, at least the first couple of chapters are really the chef's struggle and why it's it's an ill-fated journey to ever take our word for anything nutritional, but here I am telling you anyway. Um, here I am trying to get you to listen to me anyway. The book is written very tongue-in-cheek. It's very satirical, um, and I needed it to be because it's such a heavy subject. Dealing with food addiction and dealing with overcoming adversity is such a heavy subject that I needed to approach it that way in order to be able to digest it, and that's what I assume the readers would want as well. But the first couple of chapters are really talking about what it's like to be a chef, what it's like to work in a in 120, 130 degree kitchen for hours on end on your feet. And then why that makes it so easy for you to not prioritize yourself, for you to not take life so seriously. And then I go into a lot of detail, a lot of truth about my struggles and where it came from and how, how I'm, I'm an emotional eater and how I'm not alone in that and how I rewarded myself, punished myself and soothed myself with food. So it was all of them. It wasn't like I only rewarded myself or I only punished myself. A lot of my life was focused around food. It still is, to be honest. I'm just learning how to control that voice. And then I give you lots of tips and tricks, suggestions, things that I've done, anecdotes, kitchen stories to help try to explain how I got here or to try to give you ideas. Of course, everybody's journey and path is going to look a little different than mine, but just suggestions on how to get in your own way and how to start taking yourself seriously and why hydration is important, not just telling you how much water to drink, but why it matters. Because I needed that. I needed the scientific approach. And I think other people do too. It's not just a wrap or a pill. I wish it was, guys. If it was a wrap or a pill or something, we would all be thin. If it was a matter of swapping this sandwich for that one or this bag of chips for that one, we would all have this figured out. It's just not that easy. So I try to give you as much practical advice and camaraderie and support as I can and just kind of show that I'm here for you. That's the bulk of the written part of the book. And then the whole back half of the book is recipes, meal guides, suggestions, what I eat. And that hopefully will help you segue the words into an actual plan and a shopping list, which is helpful. That's great. Yeah. So that's very, I mean, that's the stuff we need, honestly, because <clears throat> hearing it is one thing, but then putting it into action and that's real helpful. Um, can I ask like, so over how many years and then what was your weight loss? Cause I know you said you had, you lost a lot of weight. What was that? What did that look like? So, and weight loss is a part of it, right? I think a lot of us get fixated on the scale and we start looking at the scale and we start going, oh, I put on two pounds or I took off this much. And for me, initially, that's, that's exactly what I was concerned about. I knew that my doctor wanted me to be 200 pounds and that's all I could think about, but that 200 pounds could have been all fat and she, it wouldn't have mattered, right? Cause the scale is not the end all be all of who you are and, and the makeup of your body. But when I started in 2017, so my first appointment with dietitian Wendy, who wrote the foreword of the book, by the way, she wrote the preface of the book. Um, when I first met with her in 2017, I weighed almost 280 pounds. Um, I was a size 24, 26 pant, usually wide, like I had to wear a wider pant because I had broader hips. Um, just to kind of give you some more stats, I wore a size 10 wedding ring. Um, I was a 46, 44 to 46 G if that means anything to my lady friends, um, I was a size nine and a half shoe. So I had these statistics, these numeric statistics that I took in there with me. And then from there, it was a slow incremental change of behaviors and patterns, which is what it takes. It's not glamorous. It's not quick. And to be honest with you, it's my weight loss journey. The graph of it is looks like a, an EKG. It's very bouncy. It goes up and down. I would lose a lot of weight and then put weight back on you know, from March to June of 2020, I gained 15 pounds because I was home and all I wanted to eat was Doritos, right? So I've had hills and valleys along the way too. The key is being able to course correct, being able to get back, being able to figure out that that's not the way you're supposed to do it. 
but all in all, uh, since as at least where I am today, since 2017, like I said, it's been almost six years. I'm right around 202 at this point. So I'm in within spitting distance of that 200 pounds that I never thought I would see. Um, I am down to like a 38 double D. So that's like three sizes, three or four sizes down. Um, I'm now in like a 14, 16 pant. I can wear a large shirt, which I was in a 3X, 4X at one point. Um, I lost a whole shoe size. Now I'm in like an eight, eight and a half, which is crazy. And my rings are sevens. So just to kind of show you overall, it's not just the number on the scale. It really affects your entire entire body, your entire being when you start to take yourself seriously and do what you need to do to be the best version of yourself you can be. And those are a lot of statistics. And I'll be honest, it was funny. I was just talking to a friend this morning. Uh, she's saying she used to never, she used to have to work to put on weight. Uh, like, mm. oh, love you. But even mm-hmm. now she yeah. actually can't lose, she can't lose weight. And it's like, or it's harder, excuse me, I should say it's harder mm-hmm. because we're over 50 and it's harder. But like, mm-hmm. I don't own a scale. And, and that's maybe that's an unhealthy approach. But I know from my clothes that I've put on weight. So I don't, you know, and I don't want to ever become because I've had friends who would literally obsess over and I don't want to ever get that way believe me, I know I eat unhealthy and I know I need to make some changes and do want to, but I'm honestly not ready to, cause I'm too lazy and I don't want to do the work. <laughs> honestly, I know what it, it takes, but, um, it's so although I, what I, my point I wanted to get to is those are a lot of numbers. And a lot of times, sometimes we only see our numbers and we should see ourselves as much more than that. So how mm-hmm. do you feel now? Do you notice more energy? Just obviously your outlook on life. I mean, you've got to feel good about what you're accomplishing and f- how you feel. That's huge. And that's something that I have hard time putting into words. You know, I'm an author over here telling you I'm having hard times putting things into words sometimes, which is true. But the fact of the matter is um, the medical, my, my physical wellness is completely different. You know, I'm 180 degrees. I've, I've completely turned around my, my life in the past six years to the point where I no longer need a CPAP. I don't have sleep apnea anymore. Um, you know, I'm not in pain anymore. My back doesn't hurt. I, I, I ran my first 5K last year. And these are all just kind of things that I've checked off the box. First of all, if you'd have seen me five or six years ago, you're not seeing me running anywhere. If somebody's running behind me, you better run with me because something's coming and it's going to kill us. Now I'm actually running for fun, which is weird. Um, other like things that, that matter is just, I said, being able to sleep better is a huge one, not being so stressed out and worrisome. And that those are things that definitely come along with feeling better and feeling more secure. But there are so many aspects. And so another battle that I discuss in the book and, you know, go into a little bit of detail here is I've always had reproductive issues, very common reproductive issues that I've talked to people about. And those reproductive issues are over for me because of this. So it does trickle down. There's a trickle down effect to this. You have to be in the right mindset. And a lot of folks aren't. So what I say is that clearing the rail will be here when you, when you're ready for it, when you're ready to come back to me, when you're ready to listen to my podcast, because I have one too, and you're ready to pick up the book it'll be here for you. And the advice will be just as useful for you then as it is now. But this is a long-term commitment. This is a marathon. And some people see it as, you know, I have to lose, I have to lose weight for a wedding in a month, or I have to do this because I I need to be thin now. And the fact of the matter is you can be thin now, but if you're thin now, you probably won't be thin forever. And that yo-yoing, that bouncing back and forth, back and forth is what I went through for years and years before I really took a look at the rail and started clearing the reasons for my food issues. Yeah. Why? And you mentioned earlier, like the food, the emotional connection. And I think that is so common. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm not asking you to speak for other people, but why do you think, cause that is so common. Why do you think food, is it just, I mean, there are other addictions obviously, but food can be such a thing that we use for joy, mm-hmm. for sadness, for everything. I, why do you think that is? My, my main reason, the reason why I think it is, is because it's completely and wholly unregulated. No one at the drive-thru is going to make you feel bad for ordering what you order. You can go through the drive-thru and order whatever the hell you want. Nobody knows it's, if it's for you or your entire family, right? You can go to the grocery store and buy whatever you want, and nobody's going to judge you for it. In fact, nobody ever said anything to me about what I ate, except for my family, who I hated at the time, right? You can, You tend to get mad at people who try to criticize the way you're living, especially when you're already defensive and you're already addicted, right? But I think the other reason for emotional eating is that it becomes very one-sided, just like every other addiction. You find comfort in it, but it will never ever give you the comfort that you seek from it. You are comforting yourself with it, but it's very one-sided. 
And so you keep trying and trying and trying to get something back from it. It doesn't care about you. Whatever you're addicted to doesn't care about you the same way you care about it. And if you put the Oreos down, somebody else will pick them up. Believe me. So you have to start. And that's why prioritizing yourself is so important. Um, because I think we fall into routines and food is something that's very routine for a lot of us. We always get pizza on Friday night. We always have tacos on Tuesday. We always yeah. stop for donuts on the way home from church, whatever it is, it becomes something that's habitual. And because it's unregulated, you can do whatever you want, which is you're, you are a human and you live probably in America. You can do whatever you want. The problem is, is that a lot of us do it for the wrong reasons. And if you're not willing to really dive into those reasons, whether it's food or cigarettes or alcohol or whatever, whether you're not willing to, when you're not willing to really dial it in, it'll always be there for you. That drive through will always be open. That bag of Doritos will always be there. The key is, is to not succumb to it as often as you might now. Yeah. And that's, that's serious work. And like I said to you, I mean, I know, and that's honestly like, uh, with wine, with whatever it is that I know I need to change. And I know myself, I have put on weight, uh, you know, I'm 51 now. And as I noticed it around 45, that belly fat, all of a sudden I'm like, Whoa, I a pants with borders are a problem. That's why I love my running, you know, stretchy pants. And it's something like I, it's that thing where it's like, okay, I want to address it, but then it's easier to sit down and go, yeah, I'm going to have that glass of wine, or I'm going to have that, you know, uh, like I'm you gonna mentioned, what's in my, I'm going to finish what's in my fridge. I'm going to finish and, what's in my pantry and I'll start Monday. Ex- exactly. Like, oh, I'll just get through this box of pop tarts and then I'll change on Tuesday or coming home from a show, like doing mm-hmm. comedy. It's like, oh, it's nine 30. It's quarter to 10. I'm hungry. What do I do? Go through like the McDonald's drive through And cause it's easy and it's not smart to do or healthy, but it's easy. Yeah. And yeah. the truth of the matter is when you're making food decisions like that, when you're making food decisions after the fact, when you're already hungry, you are like 10 times more likely to make a bad food decision, right? If you'd thought about it before you left for the show, you might have something healthy in the car waiting for you. But the fact is a lot of us don't think that far in advance. And we don't have an advocate in our side over here, like this one, to really say, you know, I can get you some meals. I can put things in your fridge that are healthier. I can get you to go snacks. A lot of people don't have resource like that. And they don't think about the fact that they're going to be hungry at some inopportune time. And getting in your own way is a huge part of clearing the rail. So what I used to do, at least initially until I learned better, was I was always tempted by drive throughs Wawa, Sheets, wherever, because it's so convenient to just stop in and grab something if you're on the road. It's nine o'clock. I'm, I'm leaving work and I, I, I didn't make anything. I don't have anything at home. So what I started doing was carrying protein with me all the time. And I look ridiculous carrying around a cooked piece of chicken. But you know what? You got to do what you got to do. Because I'm not going to stop and spend 10 bucks on something that's going to make me, that's going to give me heartburn all night and make me feel like crap because that was the truth. Yeah. Well, you, and you touched on two more things I could totally relate to saving money, right? Because we're spending money on food, yes. which, you know, unless you, I personally don't make a ton of money. And it's like, why am I spending money that I shouldn't be? And the heartburn, that's another issue of, I've really had increased over the past, let's say three or four mm-hmm. years. And it's like, oh, I'm paying for it. Like I'll be drinking some wine that's acidic and it'll be like being stabbed in the chest. And I'm like, A2 Chardonnay. It's like, you're really going to do this to me and I'll keep drinking it. But yeah, that's, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. And those are the symptoms. That's your body saying like, Hey, we don't like what's going on here, or maybe this isn't the right path, but your mind is unbelievably strong in being able to convince your body that no, we're good. We're all right. Um, and whether it's whatever that is, whatever that, that hormone, again, I'm the chef, I'm not a doctor, but whatever that is that just says, no, it's okay. We can deal with heartburn. Your body is screaming like, no, this is not, this is not what's best for us. It's amazing what you're capable of doing if you're under the gun, if you're, you know, what you will do and what you won't do, but you really have to prioritize and you really have to stop and say, you know, that does make me feel like crap when I eat it. Or, you know, I I don't like that I'm doing this. And you have to be willing to be accountable for it, to realize it was a mistake, that you are not the mistake. The choice was the mistake, right? It's not, don't personalize it and make it you that's the problem. It's the behavior that's the problem. So separate yourself from the problem and then fix the problem. Because like we also, there's a lot of shame and guilt associated with addiction, especially with food, because we know we make bad decisions, right? So like, oh, did I really need that tasty cake? Now I'm such an idiot. I'm such a failure because I did this to myself. Well, let me tell you, a hundred pounds ago, I did all of that to myself, all of it. But I had to say to myself, okay, just because I made mistakes doesn't mean I am one. So I need to separate myself from the guilt and the shame that I feel for making those mistakes. 
Yeah. And that's, you're absolutely right. And it's not always easy, right? We, we just no. want to beat her. And then when we're beating ourselves up, what do we do? It's like, we feel bad, you know, I'm going to have another glass of wine to make myself feel better eat. or exactly. some nachos or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it gets very challenging. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, before we wrap up and I wanted to mention uh, that you have other books as well, but before we close on this topic, is there anything else that you wanted to uh, you mentioned that you have a podcast and where can people go to listen and where could they go to get a copy of clearing the rail? So right now uh, clearing the rail is, as was introduced as an Amazon exclusive. So you can go out to Amazon and you can find the paperbacks there. You can also get it for Kindle. And if you belong to Kindle unlimited, it's available for you that way as well. It's going to be going wide here in the next couple of months, but right now it is an Amazon exclusive. And then as far as the podcast goes, you can actually go anywhere you get podcasts. So anywhere you would normally listen, in fact, wherever you're listening to this podcast, you can just search for clearing the rail and it'll come up. I've now recorded four seasons. So you've got plenty of back catalog to listen to. And it goes through a lot of the same stuff that's in the books. So if you have an easier time listening versus reading, you certainly can do that. And there's also recipes every the last Sunday of every month is recipes for me. So I'm giving you a constant stream of new recipe ideas, new things to try out that have your health for the most part in mind. I do give you a couple of spoil recipes every now and again. But my goal is to take away the fear that your kitchen has over you. If you're scared of your kitchen, of trying new things, of experimenting in your kitchen, my goal is to take that fear away or to alleviate it a little bit and also to provide you weekly uplift. I'm trying to give you an optimistic view. And it's like I said, 15 to 20 minutes usually are those podcast lengths. And we talk about everything from effective meal planning. I have chef Q&A questions. People send me chef questions all the time. So I answer those. And then everything we talk about compassion fatigue and anxiety and depression to even lighter stuff. And my most popular episode right now is all about my paniculectomy that I had back in November where I had all the excess skin removed after years and years of weight loss. So if you've ever been curious about a tummy tuck, or paniculectomy, you might want to look into the podcast. Oh, wow. Okay. When you said that word, I'm like, okay, ectomy is removal, but I don't know what that means. That first part is. <laughs> so a panis is the extra skin that hangs down after a significant amount of weight loss. So a paniculectomy is the removal of that skin. And it's a um, basically a medically required or a insurance covered tummy tuck. The process is very similar. And let me tell you, the celebrities make it look really easy. It is not easy. It is devastating. So if you've been curious or been interested in potentially having something like that done, like I said, please listen, because I want to be as honest and transparent about the struggle of going through that as I can. And I know that listeners appreciate that. And I thank you for, I, I think the more honest that we can be, I know with my standup, I always talk about like, yes, I'm 51. Uh, no shame to anyone who doesn't want to tell their age, but I said, I think it's important, especially as women that we're not like 29 and holding because we don't become disposable at a certain age. Women and women haven't always, women still aren't really held up and uh, praised as they should be. And it's like, we, we don't become useless after 30 or 40, just because we have more wrinkles. So I, I love and appreciate transparency and honesty like that. So I thank you very much for sharing that. Of course. Um, before we wrap up too, I just wanted to give a shout out. You also do other books uh, yes. just for, you know, just give us a little quick, um, you know, a little summary of, cause I, I loved your setup and you had very, really clearly marked, like, here's this and here's my other uh, books that I do that are, that sound really fun. So if you want to tell us about those. Yeah. So clearing the rail is the nonfiction chef story slash self-help memoir kind of book that I've been talking about, but I also write fiction as well. And I write women centric fiction. Um, I love an empowered female character. I love uh, a relatable story characters that are in scenarios that feel real. Um, I grew up reading books that were very fantastic and had kind of high fantasy elements and things, but I always appreciated a story that was grounded in some sort of reality and left me proud to be a female that left me proud to be a a, a human woman basically so when I started sitting down to really start writing fiction in a meaningful way I wanted my female characters to really shine so the five book series that's out it's now complete it came out kind of one at a time but now you're catching up and all five books are available it's called second saga and that book series is it's like a rom-com series but it's based around five friends who started a rock band in basically middle school And after decades of plugging away and plugging away at it, have finally made a name for themselves. And these five women are powerhouses, man. They are just commanding the rock and roll industry now after years and years of working at it. And so now is when 
the romantic, you know, stuff, when the foils start to begin, the foibles kind of find their way into their lives and kind of upturn the apple cart and make things more difficult for them. But they're very protective and very prideful of what they've earned. So you have a little bit of that, you know, females earning their keep and then being scared of losing it for something potentially as silly as a relationship, right? So that's what second is about. And it takes you through chronologically through these five girls really finding their place in the world because it's not all about work. It's not all about achieving something. It's also about what that means and what that affords the other half of your life, which also desperately deserves attention, is the life that you live, not just the work you do. Um, I also have a new release coming out in uh, the end of June, beginning of July, which is a suspense. So if you're into more of a mystery suspense type of story, again, strong female protagonist, um, and I really don't want to tell you a whole lot about it because, again, I don't want to spoil suspense, but if you're into, um, like, computer, like, hacker hackers and crackers, and you're into somebody digging a little bit too deep and getting themselves in trouble, that kind of thing, then you're going to really like this book. It's called Girl Alt Delete, and that will be out at the end of June, beginning of July. So if you follow me on social media or you go to jillmariedenton.com, that's where you're going to find all of those books and all that information. Wow. I love the breadth of your work. I mean, you got a little bit, that's really cool. That's great. And I love the uh, women centric uh, empowered women who are empowering, like helping to empower power other women. And I think it's important that young women see and read about and hear about the stories of, of women who are strong, you know, living their mm-hmm. best life or their, you know, they have, they fall, but they can pick themselves right back up. I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's not being, awesome. Not being ashamed about what you are and what talent you bring to this world, because we all have something to give to this world. And if you're finding that you're not sure what that is, if, if you're having to argue with yourself about your own worth in this world, then I really hope that you look into clearing the rail and that you listen because every breath you take matters or you wouldn't be here. So just just keep it pushing forward, keep moving forward, and I'll do what I can to help you. That's great. Well, I have nothing better to say than what you just said. So we're (laughs) going to close on that note. That's wonderful. So thank you so much, Jill Marie Denton. And I will put all of that in the show notes so that you can check out Jill's website. Uh, Please check out uh, Clearing the Rail on Amazon there and uh, watch for the new release in the end of June. That sounds really exciting. Very cool. So thank you so much for spending time with us today. I really appreciate it, Jill. Thank you. My pleasure. And as I always say to my listeners, I really do. uh, Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I will give one plug in the show notes. Check it out. I do have a uh, link to my buy me a coffee uh, platform, or I should say account. So if you want to help support this podcast, something as little as $5 donation, I appreciate, but it doesn't have to be monetary either. Share the podcast with people you think might enjoy it. Uh, put it on your social, give me a, a recommendation or review, just talk it up because, you know, folks like us, we need your support, uh, artists, writers, performers, small businesses, we need your support and your, uh, and that, that would mean a lot to us. Just sharing it is, is really important. So As I always say to my listeners, I do appreciate you from the bottom of my heart and the bottom of my wine glass.